Hey guys, Coach Amanda here. I just wanted to take a few minutes here to go over and talk about a few things that uh, just, I wish people had talked to me about when I was younger, whether it was in my twenties in college, um, or in my teen years, um, when I was playing and, uh, or just even when I started coaching, if somebody could help me navigate this and understand, um, leading at the higher level. And sometimes the inadvertent, you know, consequences of dealing with personalities and individuals that have insecurities. And, uh, you know, if we can just be totally honest, being a leader is hard, but having difficult conversations is even harder. And whether that's on the sidelines as a parent, um, uh, making difficult decisions as a coach, uh, you know, are you, are you making a decision for your, you know, to play a certain kid or to do certain, you know, something certain because you're concerned about your winning record, or are you doing something because it's right? And it's going to develop character for the long-term with the kids, um, even staffing, whether you're in corporate America or you're running a team and, uh, and a staff of coaching, um, or a business. Um, I know many of my listeners are business owners like myself or own academies like myself, and it, it's never easy. You're, you know, it's a faith walk. Uh, you're blessed and lucky if you have really good mentors that have great wisdom, but a lot of the time you're making, you know, decisions that you think are best and hoping that they're going to turn out the way you anticipate them uh, to turn out. And sometimes it doesn't do that. So, you know, we're always learning. And I think the, the most difficult thing is, you know, when your trust is broken and, and where friendships fall apart, or, you know, even if, um, in some cases you, um, maybe get, uh, cut from a, a team, maybe you're on the national team and you get cut, maybe you're playing professional and you get cut, um, you're not playing or, um, you know, whatever it may be that has your trust broken, it could be with a coach, it could be with a business partner, you know, it's learning to trust again, because you trust who you are. And that's one of the hardest things that I've had to learn is, you know, I, I don't think I'm alone here. I think a lot of you have gone through different things where your trust has been broken, you know, people quit, and you didn't expect them to quit. Um, people in friendships with you, uh, business partnerships with you, uh, whatever it may be, um, maybe players leave you and go to a different uh, college or a professional team, you know, et cetera. And you've invested a lot in them, or, or it could be a, in an academy at the youth level. You've invested a lot of, into them. You care about them. And it hurts because you've poured so much of your heart into what you do or into those individuals. And what you expected to happen in the end was not, not what you expected. And I learned this a long time ago from, from some mentors that I met, uh, and started mentoring me when I was in 20, when I was in my twenties. And I remember one of them, his name was Greg said to me, Amanda, stop punishing everybody else for the hurts that other people did to you. And I'll never forget how that impacted me because I had a lot of baggage coming out of my teen years with bad coaches um, bad programs, you name it. Uh, my career ended not the way I wanted to. I had to make a character decision and retire early. And I never got to play my last game and that hurt. And it affected my trust with people, but I didn't realize I was taking that baggage into every single relationship. I went, you know, went into, whether it was business, whether it was sports, um, coaching, I began to kind of expect or judge or anticipate that that same person was going to treat me the way the last person was instead of giving that person the chance. And I think that's just something that it takes a lot of emotional maturity and trust in ourselves to know that we are good enough and that we are trustworthy and we are doing good or, Hey, we need a change here and I need to own those mistakes, but I'm going to find people that I can trust and people that are going to have my back. I'm going to trust one more time and that there are good people out there. I remember when I was in my uh, mid twenties, I got involved with a, a large investment firm. I was a minor, a small investor with a bunch of uh, large investors into a company and uh, had a lot of fun. 
we invested a lot of money, a time, energy. We learned a lot. We had a lot of great friendships. And one of my good friends who was a majority holder in the company uh, was like a brother to me. And he and his wife decided all of a sudden cut off communication with everybody in our business group and move to the Pacific Northwest and sell their share of the business. They didn't meet with hardly anybody except their father, who was a majority holder as well. And we didn't know what to believe. We felt betrayed. And I remember the majority, one of the majority holders, senior leadership people, who was the dad of my friend, um, pulled everybody together and let them know what happened. And what he told us was that basically, in a way, his wife went crazy, which was kind of believable with a few instances. She's a great person, but she's she had her few moments and that she was basically over being a business owner and wanted to start new and move to the Northwest. And they had a different dream and vision and that he decided to follow suit and just up and left us. So the first thing, you know, I felt was, oh my gosh, I feel betrayed. Like, dude, why didn't you come and talk to me? Why didn't you explain? Like we, we've, we've like gone through a lot of life, you know, and, and business, and we've done a lot of great things. And you know, we talked to where we were going to help this company go. And now you're, you're gone. And it just didn't make sense. And I've always been that type of person that I understand there's two sides to every story, but for some reason at 25 years old, I wouldn't go find that other story. I, I don't, I just, I trusted the dad, the, the senior leadership. I trusted what they said. And after a few years passed, um, we kept in touch real briefly over social media. Um, it, the, the, the friend that was like a brother and I'd kept in touch. Um, but we never talked about that difficult conversation about why he and his wife left, why they left what we were doing. And I remember one day it was probably, I was about, I think it was about five years later, maybe. And I just was like, you know, I'm going to shoot him a text. I feel like I just need to fly out there and see them. And I need to find their side of the story. I shot him a text and no joke. One minute later, he sent me a message back said, Hey, um, yeah. When can you get on a plane to come out here? I said, three days. Sound good. He says, sounds great. Don't worry about hotel. Don't worry about anything. We'll pick you up. Don't even get a rental car. We got you. So flew out to the Pacific Northwest. Everything that could have gone wrong with this flight went wrong. (laughs) I mean, planes breaking down, missing, you know, my next connection flight. It just, my rental car, like they took away my reservation because I was three hours late because I missed my connecting flight, got rerouted to three different airports. So long story short, he drove two and a half hours into a different state to pick me up at a different airport and drive me back. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened because when he drove out there, I, I wasn't in the car by myself. Now I'm, I'm with him. And we're, we've got two hours ahead of us, well, two and a half really, of nothing but, you know, Idaho mountain roads. And I literally, we, we have to face each other. We have to have that difficult conversation. As Brene Brown, I'm not sure if any of you guys have read uh, Daring Greatly or Dare to Lead, but I highly recommend it. But she calls it Rumble. Let's have those difficult conversations and let's work through them and find a solution and, and find a, a commonality. Let's, let's, let's find common ground and understand each other's perspective and where we're coming from. And we did that in that car. And I'll never forget him telling me the other story that they didn't abandon us and that nobody called him to find his story. I was the first and it took years. And he was hurt that even his dad said, had miss said some things about his decision-making, but more than that, um, he said he was just really upset that nobody had the courage after all of our friendships to come to us. And I said, well, that was a two way street. You could have come to us too. Right. And he owned that. But I think the thing that really helped me the most in that car ride where we were having this difficult conversation was when he said that people will do what they feel like they need to do to protect what they need to protect. See, I was friends with his dad and his dad was like a mentor, like a second father to me. And so 
I didn't have a reason to not believe his dad. But when I began to hear their story, it made me question what was truth of what he told me. Should I, can I trust him again? Because trust was a huge issue for me. But when he said that people will do what they feel like they need to do to protect what they need to protect, it began to click. It began to make sense that everybody has a different view and picture of what truth is and, and what success is to them. And they will write the narrative of what they think the truth is. And it may not be really the truth. That's why you got to know every side of every story. Now, going back to a few years prior when we found out he was leaving, one of the things his dad told us is don't reach out to him. Don't contact him. Don't, you know, just, just leave it alone. And I did think that was a little weird. And I don't know why I didn't act on that. But what I learned is that everybody has insecurities. We're all working through them at some levels. Now, some people, I'll give it to you guys, some are not. <laughs> some are avoiding and saying everybody else is the problem, but that's a whole nother topic. But everybody has some type of insecurity and it's about emotionally whether or not you can work through that insecurity and still find and take the high ground, you know, to take the high road as, as many people say. And, you know, you have to know that whether you have a good leader or you have a bad leader, either way, you can learn from that situation. If you have a bad coach, which I've had more bad coaches than I've had good coaches, you can learn from them and it's going to make you a better leader. I think one of the biggest things is my, in high school, I, 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 I had a, a couple good coaches in my high school team. And I had one in particular that played favorites and they knew that clicks were going on. They knew the culture was bad. They knew that the girls were breaking our values and drinking and getting drunk, some doing drugs, you name it. And they wouldn't, they, they cared more about their winning record than anything else. And I was telling this to a player the other day, going through a similar experience that, you know, I, I rode the bench a, bench a lot of times and I would get so mad. I would ask him every single year, coach, what can I do to get better? Oh, you need to get faster. I would go join the track team. I would have a strength coach. I, I got super fast. I was the fastest person, not by just a few yards, but like 10 yards. And we had some national pool team players on our team. Okay, coach, why am I not playing now? Oh, Amanda, you need to get better at your vertical. I'm a shorter goalkeeper. Okay. So spend the rest of the time working on my vertical. I get higher. I can jump farther. I can dive farther. I'm great at PKs. You name it. Coach, why am I not playing again? And he'd come up with some other excuse and some other excuse and some other excuse. And none of them were valid. They were just to push me away because he didn't want to be honest with me in my opinion, but that's another story. And I got a bad attitude. But then after about a year of only playing the games that he felt I should play in, and riding the bench, I began to sit on the sidelines and my perspective changed because what happened was I was able to study the game. I was able to watch when plays were being formed up. I was able to watch team dynamics. I was able to study what happens on the sidelines. Are people paying attention or are they engaged in the game? I began to just start communicating from the sidelines, just like I would as if I was in goal. And guess what happened? I became a more strategic player. My soccer IQ, as many coaches call it, went up. I began to be able to see plays forming up two steps ahead. And I was able to strategically get my defense in a certain place. So I didn't get shoot. I, I didn't get a shot on goal. They shot around me or right at me. I never knew that I wasn't going to go pro. I went semi-pro, but I didn't know I was going to go. I, I wanted to go pro, but I didn't know I was not going to go pro. I wanted to be a part of the national team, but I was much shorter than what a lot of the goalkeeper uh, profiles that they would want to see. And, it, and honestly, my skill wasn't as good as many others. That's why I didn't make it. Because if I was good enough, I would have been on there. And that was so hard for me to admit to myself for a long time. 
but hindsight 2020 and looking back, I realized that everything I went through was preparing me to be a better leader. It was preparing me to be a better coach. I needed to sit on that bench and be able to understand the game from a coach's perspective. I needed to understand strategy. I needed to understand communication. I needed to understand culture and dynamics, but I also needed a bad coach to show me what not to do when I do coach and to help me understand how important it is to protect the culture and the environment of a business, of a team, of an academy, of anything that I do. Guess what? When I went into corporate America, I had bad bosses. I had good bosses. I learned from all of them. And as a boss now, I don't like to call it that. I like to say mentor, but as a boss now, you know, I haven't done everything right, but I've learned. And I try to involve my staff in that growth process for myself and learn from them just as much. I remember when I first started my first company, I was 19 years old. Um, I had a bunch of senior investors and a lot of them were very successful in corporate America and CEOs. And one of the things they told me is they said, hire people that are smarter than you. Hire people that are better at whatever you do than you. And I looked at them and I'm like, wait, but I'm the boss. They go, no, 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 no. Yeah, you are the boss. You have that title. But smart leaders, smart coaches, smart bosses hire people that are smarter than them. Because those individuals can do things that they're weak at. And it only makes the team and the company grow. And in the end, you look good for what you do. <sighs> that was kind of crazy because most people operate out of insecurity. Most people are intimidated if somebody's better at something than them. That was a eye opener for me. And that helped me understand, wow. I need to face some things on myself. When I feel that insecurity and that's that what I call the spirit of comparison rising up in me, I need not to lean into that. I need to instead ask myself, why do I feel insecure right now? If I'm working my guts out and in a deep struggle and I'm not succeeding as much as I'd want to, and my friend or coworker or somebody else is, you know, is, is, is liked more than me <laughs> is if my staff member is liked more than me, if, if, you know, they're getting success or they've had a, you know, an accomplishment. I think one of the biggest things I learned is the true test of leadership and emotional maturity is, can I be just as happy for them and proud of them as if is, is the same as if it was my own accomplishment? And I remember a time in my life where I couldn't. I remember a time in my life when it'd make me angry. The internal dialogue would be, they don't deserve that. I've done more than them. It would be, I'm better than them. It'd be a lot of different things. And I had to grow through that. And I'm still, I still catch myself. I think like any of us do. But this is an ongoing journey, becoming a leader. You don't arrive. And just because you have a title does not mean you are a leader. John Maxwell says, the true definition of a leader is when you can turn around and you can see who's following you, not because they have to, but because they want to. Because they like you, they look up to you. That's, that really made me check myself. How many people are following me? Not because they have to, but because they want to. I think one step farther is also, even though those people are following you, are you still humble enough? Am I still humble enough to know when to say I don't have the answers and when to hire somebody that's better than me or suggest somebody that's better than me or go get answers from somebody that's better than me? What are my values? Do I live up to them? Do I say what I'm going to do and do what I'm going to say? Do my words line up with my actions? Not sometimes, not one time, all the time. 
I saw I saw this quote the other day and um I I I listened to a lot of Toby Mac. I don't know if you guys know who that is. It's a really good uh, Christian artist. And uh, he puts out these amazing, amazing quotes. And basically the quote, this is my interpretation was, you know, yes, you're talking the talk, but does your, and you say, amen, but does your life say amen? Do you live what you preach? Not everybody does that. Not everybody. And there was times where I haven't, or I began to get a little weak at it. And I had to check myself and it's an ongoing battle. I'm only in my early thirties and I know I don't know everything. And I know that there's still a journey ahead of me of learning so much about leadership that I'm probably going to stray again. But the difference is, is that do you know, and are you self-aware of when you begin to get insecure or a little ahead of yourself? And are you emotionally mature enough to stop yourself and go, why am I doing this? I need to learn from this. One of the things that I went through, whether it was in teams or corporate America, was I started noticing I was going through the same situation with female bosses where they would kick me off projects or they would lay me off, (laughs) put it nicely. They would fire me for different reasons. And it wasn't performance because I would be blowing things like out of the water. It wasn't this or it wasn't that or on a team. They give you the silent treatment. (laughs) I'm sure many girls know that, right? Because girls can be petty and they can be mean. And for me, it always confused me because I was just about the team. I didn't play those games. I'm like, I don't have time for that. Life is too short but I had to learn that not everybody thought that way. (laughs) Newsflash. I had to learn how my own kind thought, even though I didn't think that way, I had to understand where they were coming from. I had to understand that we all have different levels of insecurity. Call me slow. (laughs) It may be, but we all have different levels of insecurity. We all have to work through them in different ways. But I can be the example if I understand and I know that what that looks like, right? I can be the example. I can be the encourager to have the difficult conversations instead of always walking on eggshells and seeing the issue. I can pull that person aside and go to them and say, Hey, listen, I care way too much about our friendship and I'm feeling something's uncomfortable right now. I want to have this difficult conversation because our relationship and our friendship means that much to me. I'm willing to go there with you. And my encouragement is if you're struggling right now, whether it's a friend, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a coach player dynamic relationship of some sort, um, maybe it's your boss, do what Brene Brown says and be willing to rumble. Be willing to have that difficult conversation. It's not going to be easy. It's going to test every ounce of maturity, emotionally, and leadership, you name it. You're going to be exhausted going through it. It's going to take a lot out of you. But how much is that relationship worth to you? How much do you value that relationship? How much do you value growth? And are you willing to go through a little bit of pain and discomfort to become the best version of yourself? Because here's the thing is whether guy, girl, whatever, we are better together. We were designed to be friends with people. We were designed to be in relationships with people. We were designed to be a team. But a team cannot function if everybody is wanting all the glory and the attention. What makes teams, great teams, great is the ability to love each other, support each other when we're down, support each other when we're up, and always remember the bigger picture is we win together, not as individuals. I hope this helps somebody out there today.